David Gordon White received his PhD from the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. He studied Hinduism at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris between 1977 and 1980, and again in 1985 and 86. David is the J.F. Rowney Professor of Comparative Religions at the University of California here in Santa Barbara, where he has been teaching since 1996. He is the author of five monographs, four published by the University of Chicago Press, Myths of the Dogman, The Alchemical Body, Kiss of the Yogini, and Sinister Yogis. He also edited Tantra in Practice through Princeton University Press, which also has produced his most two recent books, Yoga in Practice and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, a biography. Dr. White has been the recipient of several research fellowships and grants, including a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship and three Fulbright Research Fellowships for India and Nepal. Now, in addition to these numerous, <laughs> impressive, and highly coveted awards and accomplishments, David also has a secret superpower, a city of his own, which I was once privileged to witness him demonstrate or reveal in a lecture hall in front of 100 to 150 UCSB undergraduate students. In his death and dying course, yeah, uh, freestyle hip hop. <laughs> if you're fortunate, he might oblige this evening. <laughs> Without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. David Gordon White for his presentation this evening, Mythic Imagination Along the Silk Road, Female Deities of Power and Transcendence. Thank you, David. It's always nice to be introduced by another David. Um, this image, I'm going to return to at the very end of my talk, um, which I'm going to read for the most part, but just a little bit of patter around it. Well, you can see who the female deity of power and transcendence is on the image. And um, the fellow to her left is a yogi. Uh, but that's not all that's going on here. And uh, I'll be explaining why that's not the case, or why that is the case uh, in the minutes that follow. And then we'll come back to this at the end and say something about it. So for the past seven years, I've been working on a book titled Diamonds Are Forever, Diamonds, Demons, Contacts and Exchanges in the Eurasian Pandemonium. The principal aim of the book is to demonstrate that long before air travel and the internet, the ancient and medieval inhabitants of the Eurasian landmass were a people in motion, and that those people had similar anxieties and concerns regarding sickness and injury, the problem of death and the human condition, and the unseen forces that governed their lives. They talked about them with each other, they adopted them from one another, and they sometimes imposed their own understandings of them upon others. Most of that ancient and medieval world was polytheistic, a virtual pandemonium of gods, demigods, ancestral deities, and spirit beings of every sort, with the lines between them often blurred, especially when those diamonds were shapeshifters who could also manifest as humans, animals, and birds. Today I'm going to focus on a group of female supernatural shapeshifters whose ancient names are best translated by the English word witch, or something like were creature, as in werewolf, but lady werewolf. And as I hope to prove to your satisfaction, a core set of ancient and medieval witchcraft traditions traversed the pagan and Christian West, the Islamic world, Hindu India, and the Buddhist Far East. While there can be no question that these female beings possess great and often terrifying power, you may be well asking yourselves what sort of transcendence these hordes of blood-sucking creatures I'll be discussing in the first part of my talk could have themselves embodied or offered to others, and I hope to make that clear in the second part of my talk. So I begin with a story about a barber, as told by one of India's great storytellers, a certain Soma Deva, who in about 1070 wrote a Sanskrit language anthology titled The Ocean of Rivers of Story. For reasons that will become clear, the story is told through the mouth of the barber himself. Dridhavarman, our present king, had a father of dissolute morals. 
I was that king's slave and so carried out the duties appropriate to my status. One day, while strolling in my neighborhood, he espied my wife. She was young and beautiful, and he was attracted to her. He asked the people around him who she was, and they told him she was the wife of a barber. Thinking to himself that a barber could do him no harm, he came into my house. Then, after having his way with my wife, that cursed monarch returned to his palace. As fate would have it, I was away from home that day, but when I arrived back the following morning, I found my wife in an altered state, and I asked her what the matter was. With no small amount of pride, she related the events of the previous day, just as they had transpired. And so it was that the king continued to increase my wife's prestige by taking his pleasure with her. Seeing no other way of dealing with the matter, I began to eat very little so as to emaciate my body and appear enfeebled. In that condition, pale, skeletal, and out of breath, I presented myself to the king and offered him the services of my profession. Noting my weakness, he began to question me on how I had fallen into such a state, and when he wouldn't stop, I threw myself at his feet, declaring, Master, my wife is a witch. The word is dakini. When I'm asleep, she pulls my innards out through my ass, and after that, she sucks them dry, and then she chucks them back inside again. That's why I'm all dried out. Even with a rich and steady diet, how can I possibly be a picture of health? My words planted a seed of doubt in the king's mind, and he thought, is it possible she's a witch? Have I fallen under her power? I who stuff myself with food, has she been sucking on my guts too? Tonight I will put a plan into action and test her myself, upon which the king had me serve him his supper. Plainly having a witch for a wife was viewed as a dangerous vocation in medieval Kashmir, and in medieval Nepal, and actually more recently in Nepal, where this uh, painting is from, uh, I was told at the temple of Chinnamasta, the severed-headed goddess in uh, Patan, that um, this fellow is the husband of this woman, and that's an old witch, and she's a young witch, and she's about to be in initiated. When she sacrifices her husband, you see he's got a rope around his neck uh, as a human sacrifice, and you can see he's not doing too well there. So it's dangerous to have a witch for a wife. This is a notion that's persisted down to the present day in South Asia. Witches are able to surreptitiously suck the life out of their husbands and other victims, causing them to waste away. Some 40 years ago, the anthropologist Lawrence Babb noted that the wives of barbers are also thought to be prone to witchcraft. He also recounted several modern day stories about witches, which resonate uncannily with the claims made by the barber in Somadeva's story from the 11th century. And one such tale told to Bab in the 1960s involved a newlywed groom from Nayora, a village in the Chhattisgarh district of central India. And here's how that story goes. A newly married couple in Nayora happened to walk by the house of a witch one night. The witch saw them and became angry. Knowing nothing of this, the couple went home to bed. Later that night, the witch came in the form of a cat. She climbed on the roof of the house and hung a string down through a hole so that the end touched the young man. She then began to suck his blood up through the string. The young man woke up, saw the string, and immediately realized what was happening. He brought in a pot of water and put the end of the string in it, and as he watched, the level of the water went down steadily. The pot finally became empty. When the witch's stomach was filled with water, she returned to her human form. Then she fell down and died. These are words that I'm going to work through in my first part of my talk. Um, this is a, actually a medieval European image of a hyena um, having its way with some poor human. Um, notice the hyena's genitalia. You'd think it was a guy, wouldn't you? Huh? We can't be so sure. I'll come back to that, too. Witches and demonesses who fed upon the vital fluids of their victims were a commonplace of Soma Deva's medieval life world. Called yoginis, or dakinis, or shakinis, or shabaris, they were known to suck the life out of their victims to fuel their transformations into various avian and mammalian forms. When yoginis or dakinis took the form of birds, or mammals, or perhaps flying mammals, their victims' vital essence were what fueled their flight. While scattered references are found to the yoginis and dakinis in earlier Indian inscriptions and scriptures from the first centuries of the common era, 
It was in the post 7th century Tantras that these supernatural female figures made their grand entrance into the South Asian textual record. Soma Deva's Kashmir, you all know where Kashmir is, way up in the northernmost part of India, uh, was the epicenter of Hindu Tantra, a ritual system whose imagery and ideology in which these female figures played a central role permeated every aspect of religious life. Although their names gradually faded from the scriptural record following the decline of Tantra in South Asia, these dread beings have remained an integral part of popular demonological traditions down to the present day. One element of modern witchcraft traditions not found in the medieval literary or scriptural record is that of replacement or substitution. You, you saw that the, the barber's wife, she takes his inners out and she sucks them dry and throws them back in again. So it's, this, is, this is a variation on that. So for example, a late 19th century source speaks of the jigar core, a word that means liver, liver eater, um, as a witch, who when she takes out a man's liver, she leaves it uneaten for two days. And if after eating it, she's put under the influence of an exorcist, she can be forced to take the liver of some other animal and put it back in to replace the one that was taken from the original victim. The semantic range of this Hindustani word jigar is not limited to the liver as a specific internal organ. It also applies to the heart, also more in the figurative than the literal sense, denoting a person's core, their pith, their innermost essence, their flesh, even their soul. Now, whereas jigar core defines a witch in terms of what she does to her victims, this Persian term kaftar defines her in terms of her shape-shifting abilities. This is attested in three 14th century sources. Now the primary sense of the word kaftar in Persian is striped hyena, a creature whose historical habitat once extended from North Africa to the Nilgiri Hills of South India. While generally a timid carnivore, it has been known to kill donkeys, eat human carcasses, and bite off the limbs of small children sleeping in the open with the alleged killing or kidnapping of children by striped hyenas reported across much of South and West Asia. As a term denoting a nocturnal creature that eats human carcasses, kaftar also carries the metaphorical meaning of a anything, any creature that despoils the remains of the dead. Beyond this, however, there are reports from the Western Sudan and parts of Asia of a half-human, half-hyena creature depicted as a monstrous and destructive man-eater that changes its form, usually in the night, and terrorizes people. These traditions are mentioned by the Egyptian encyclopedist Aldimiri, who in his circa 1370 CE Life of Animals speaks of vampire-like hyenas that suck the blood from the throats of their sleeping victims. Such was also the reputation of the kaftar in India, as attested in a discussion of magical strategies found in a 14th century, mid 14th century Persian language work titled The Comfort of Man for combating were hyenas, so these change, shift, shape, shape shifting hyenas, men or women who had transformed themselves into striped hyenas. Sometime in the 1330s or 40s, the Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta, who lived in India for many years, provides the earliest known mention of this were creature describing its predations in the Agra region, about 130 miles south of Delhi. That's where the Taj Mahal is. And he says, in the surroundings of the city, there are many voracious animals. One of its inhabitants related to me that a lion used to break into the city in the night, although the gates were closed, and that he used to molest the people so much that he killed many. One night, the lion broke into a house and carried away a boy from his bed. Curiously enough, someone told me that he who did so was not a lion, but a man of the magician class called Joki, who assumed the form of a lion. Some of the Jokis are such that as soon as they look at a man, the latter instantly falls dead. The common people say that in such a case of a man being killed by a mere look, if his chest were cut open, one could see no heart, which they say has been eaten up. Such is, for the most part, the practice with women, and the woman who acts in this manner is called a kaftar, a hyena. Like the South Asian 
Yoginis and Dakinis, the Perso-Arabic Kaftars, are shapeshifters. And although Ibn Battuta uses the term joki, you may recognize the word yogi there, to refer to the magician class in general, he's, his identification of kaftars with shape-shifting women would indicate that he was identifying these with female yogis. And what's the word from a female yogi? Yogini. Well, yogini can mean female yogi. It can mean a few other things that I will come, I will come to shortly. Um, and even today, again, uh, ethnography sh has uh, brought out the uh, fact that even today in parts of Western India, it is thought that a dakin, which is just a modern vernacular term for, oh, I have a pointer, for dakini, dakins can extract the liver of victims from 150 miles away. So it's something they can do at a great distance. In his classic eight, 1983 ethnography, The Death of a Witch, the anthropologist G.M. Carstairs revisited several of these themes, concluding with a comparative observation with respect to the Rajasthani village in which he carried out his fieldwork for several decades. He says, Indian witches are still believed to practice a magical form of cannibalism. In this part of India, whenever an adult or child succumbs to a wasting disease, the onlookers believe that a witch is somehow drinking her victim's blood or devouring his or her liver. Not surprisingly, the Dakin is greatly feared and hated. The account of witches' behavior given in local folklore bears many similarities to medieval accounts of witchcraft in Europe. An ancient Roman class of shape-shifting witches, the strigae, that's the plural of striga, are first mentioned in Plautus's 191 BC comedy, the Pseudolus. Here, a cook pours out his scorn on his rival's culinary arts, saying, when these people season the meals they're cooking, they don't use spices for cooking. They use strigae to eat out the entrails of the living guests. And that's why, he says, people here live such short lives. Later Roman sources frequently identified the strigae with screeching birds that commonly preyed on their victims by removing their inner substance through biting or sucking. You know what? I have to go back to my story about the king because I left out the last part, and it's really important. I just realized that. So let me come back. The king had him serve him his supper, remember? Now it gets really good. <laughs> Upon returning home, the barber, remember? I burst out in tears in front of my wife, and when she asked me the reason, I replied with words, my darling, listen to what I have to say, but promise you'll reveal it to no one. The king has teeth, sharp as diamonds, growing out of his arse. Just today, when I was doing my job, they broke my razor, which is, truth be told, of excellent quality. From now on, my razor is going to shatter every time I'm down there. How am I supposed to come up with a new razor every day? The reason I'm crying is that his bottom is ruining my bottom line. <laughs> it's a bit free with my translation. <laughs> my words inspired my wife to make the most of that very night so that once the king who would be visiting her had fallen asleep, she could have a peek at his marvelous anal dentition. That night the king came and enjoyed my wife, and then recalling my words, feigned sleep as if he were exhausted. Thinking he was asleep, my wife softly stretched her fingers out to his arse to touch it, his teeth. No sooner had my wife's hand brushed his buttocks than did the king jump up screaming, a witch, a witch, and he ran away in terror. Since that time, my wife, whom the terrified king has abandoned, has been satisfied with her fate in life and has only had eyes for me. That's how, thanks to my resourcefulness, I was once able to free my wife from the clutches of the king. I'm so glad I got back to that. Okay, so now to return to our uh, Roman uh, stories about witches. Um, so we've had Pseudolus's witty little uh, repartee by the cook. Later, Roman sources frequently identified the strigae with screeching birds that commonly preyed on their victims by removing their inner substance through biting or sucking. A vivid account of their predations is chronicled in Ovid's Fasti, a work that he wrote in the year eight of the Common Era, where he says about these strigae, these are greedy birds. Big as their head, goggle their eyes. Their beaks are formed for rapine. Their wings are blotched with gray their claws fitted with hooks. 
They fly by night and attack nurseless children and defile their bodies, snatched from their cradles. They are said to rend the flesh of sucklings with their beaks, and their throats are full of the blood which they have drunk. Screech owl is their name, but the reason of the name is that they are wont to screech, stridere is the Latin, so striga, stridere, horribly by night. Whether therefore they are born birds, or made such by an enchantment, are nothing, and are nothing but old hags transformed into birds by a spell, they came into the chambers of Proka, and Proka was the future king of um, the place called Abba Longa. In the chambers of Proka, a child only five days old, he was a fresh prey for the birds. They sucked his infant breast with greedy tongues, and the poor child squalled and cried for help. Alarmed by the cry of her fosterling, the nurse ran to him and found his cheeks scored by their rigid claws. The nurse calls upon a nymph, a sort of guardian angel named Crane, who then performs a ritual to protect the child. And that ritual ends with her doing the following. Then she held out the raw innards of a sow, just two months old, saying, ye birds of the night, spare the child's innards. A small victim falls for a small child. Take, I pray ye, a heart for a heart, entrails for entrails. This life we give you for a better life. After that, it said the birds did not violate the cradle, and the boy recovered his former color. In India, you'd give a goat to the uh, yoginis in, uh, because they don't eat pork, generally speaking, in uh, Hindu or Muslim India. But basically the same sort of uh, substitution. So here's another of these witch stories from ancient Rome. Uh, this is from Petronius' uh, Satyricon, first century. Um, it's not one of the stories that got made into Fellini's movie. Um, in which the, shriek, the shrieking strigae enter into a child's death chamber during the period of mourning. And here's how that goes. While I still had hair down my back, my master's favorite died. So while his poor mother was bewailing him and several of us were sharing her sorrow, suddenly the strigae began to screech. We had a Cappadocian in the house at the time, a tall fellow, quite brave and a man of muscle. He could lift an angry bull off the ground. He rushed boldly out of doors with a naked sword and ran a woman through the middle. We heard a groan, but to tell the honest truth, we didn't see the witches themselves. But our big fellow came back and threw himself on a bed, and his whole body was blue as if he'd been flogged. Of course, it's because a witch's hand had touched him. We shut the door to return to our mourning, but when the mother put her arms around the body of her son, she felt it and saw that it was a little bundle of straw. It had no heart, no inside or anything. Of course, the witches had carried off the boy and put a straw doll, the Latin is stramenticium vavatonem, in his place. Ah, yes, I would beg you to believe there are wise women and night riders who can turn the whole world upside down. Well, the tall fellow never came back to his proper color after this affair, but died raving mad a few days later. Now, this word stramentium, stramenti, stramenticium vivatonum has often been translated as straw doll, but Christopher McDonough suggests that the term possibly meant the body of the boy himself with the moisture of his vitality removed. I would suggest a third possibility that's attested in medieval and early modern sources from across Europe, and that is that witches replaced their victims' inner organs with straw. In the wake of this Roman tradition, accounts of the dread strigae spread across the whole of Europe with the names of the witches changing as they entered into the lexicons of a variety of languages, ranging from the Italian strega to the Russian striga and so forth. The 5th century Frankish legal code, Lex Salica, ruled on what was to be done if a stria devours a man, while 7th century Lombard law levied fines against persons for simply claiming that a striga could kill a victim by devouring it from within, intrinsecus, which reminds us of the innards already encountered in the barber's tale from Kashmir and Ovid's account of Proca and the witches. The 7th to 8th century John Damascanus identified strigae, whom people also call galudes, as women who known to fly around houses and enter through closed doors to suffocate and devour the livers and the entire constitution of infants. Similarly, a 13th century Middle High German poem refers to a witch here called an Unholder, 
who cuts out her victim's heart and stuffs straw in its place. Other old Germanic traditions know of a fearsome goddess named Bechta or Pechta, who, when not offered fish and dumplings on her festival day, cuts open men's bellies and fills them with chopped straw. So you better give her dumplings on her festival day. As Ovid's tale indicates, Roman traditions played on the ambiguity of these witches' identities in the same way that the South Asian record has done for its supernatural shape-shifting predators. Were they born birds or enchanted old hags transformed into fowls? So too in Petronius' tale of horror, the Cappadocian man of muscle, upon hearing the screeching of the strigae, is confronted first by a woman whom he runs through with a sword but to no avail. And although McDonough notes that in the Roman world, the belief in the strix, that's the Greek word actually, strix in Greek, striga in Latin, in the singular, the belief in the strix as transformed old women was widespread. But what they were transformed into remains unclear, ranging from various nocturnal raptors like night ravens, screech owls, horned owls, to bats, remember Ovid's birds of the night, that might be a description of a bat as well. So, some common themes. Here a review of the elements comprising the th three bodies of lore, South Asian, Perso-Arabic, and European, is in order. In them, witches are female shapeshifters, that is, human or superhuman beings that transform into predatory or carrion-feeding raptors or mammals. They prey upon their victims by extracting or sucking out their inner fluids or organs invisibly, sometimes from a distance, and sometimes filling their empty body cavities with straw or some other substitute. They are night creatures capable of penetrating secured human dwellings, and in some cases, they're identified by the raucous noise they make. I've already said strigae derived theoretically from stridere to screech, and the um, Sanskrit, dakini, no one's quite sure what the derivation is, but one of the possible roots is dum, which means to make noise. So they too could be noise makers. Finally, under certain circumstances, they will restore their victims' inner organs to them. Since the extant narratives of these witch like ware creatures appeared in the Roman world before being attested anywhere in Africa or Asia, and because of the uncanny similarities between their described behaviors, I would suggest that these traditions were carried eastward to India via the Silk Road in the first half of the Common Era. And while my thesis remains tentative, I can be more confident about the trajectory taken by these witchcraft traditions once they were exported, together with Buddhist Tantra, out of South Asia and into Tibet, China, and Japan. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about that process, which brings different sorts of dynamics into play. Um, I'm going to leave behind for the moment my considerations of the cross-cultural dissemination of these accounts out of Rome and into greater Europe and Asia, and turn to the specific way in which they were adapted first in India and later in Inner and East Asia into a religious system in which being eaten by witches was a privileged means to transcending the human condition. And then I'll conclude this second part of my talk with a theory about the ancient Indian origins of this special encounter between man-eating, shape-shifting females and the ascetics who would come to be known as yogis. So with the advent of Tantra in India in about the seventh century, the relationship between yoginis or dakinis and humans underwent a radical transformation as these ravening female shapeshifters became integrated into a new ritual, metaphysical, and soteriological system, soteriological pertaining to salvation. The early tantric scriptural record, which features males voluntarily offering themselves up for possession and consumption by these ferocious ware creatures, offers a window onto the unique tantric appropriation of the South Asian, if not pan your asian femenological substratum. To begin, the wild female yoginis and dakinis were grouped into kulas, a term frequently translated as clan. It's K-U-L-A. You'll see it on the screen later. The term's frequently translated as clan or lineage, but actually pack or swarm 
are more accurate primary senses of the term. Kulas of female beings that were subordinated to usually male tantric high gods. In spite, however, of that subordination, that metaphysical subordination, the yoginis and dakinis remained autonomous, entirely independent in matters of esoteric tantric ritual, since it was they alone, and this is very important for both Hindu and Buddhist tantra, at least early Hindu and Buddhist tantra, it was the yoginis and dakinis alone who had the power to trans form male initiates into true tantric practitioners by initiating them and by transmitting their tantric gnosis, the secret knowledge of tantra, to them. How did they do it? We've already seen, did you notice there was a jackal in the first slide I showed you? Okay. So, woman on top in both cases, but uh, looks like she's eating the guy in the first and uh, having sex with the guy in the second. Actually, there's a, there's a lovely, uh, India had a poetic, has a poetic tradition in Sanskrit called um, Shlesha, where you can write the same set of word, syllables in a row, but because the language is so malleable, you can read that set of syllables in at least two different ways. Someone has done that with the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which is like I don't understand that because these are both incredibly long epics and somehow they've managed to do a shlesha on it so that you're reading about the Pandavas and the Kauravas if you read it one way and you're reading about Rama and, uh, and Ravana if you read it another way. The shlesha I want to just briefly allude to is that it's in a poem by a, a 12th century Kashmirian poet where if you read the poem one way, the verse one way, it's about a woman making love to her husband or her, her lover on top. And if you read it the other way, it's about a jackal eating some poor sucker. Um, so these are the two ways to relate to a yogini or a dakini. Following what Alexis Sanderson, he's like the god of tantric studies, has termed the Kaula Reformation, initiation by the yoginis came to be cast as an erotic encounter. Taking the form of lithe beauties possessed of the power of flight, the yoginis initiated and transmitted transformative teachings to male humans through their sexual emissions as fluid gnosis. That was the tantric initiation once it became sexualized. Men drank the yoginis' sexual emissions or menstrual emissions or both. However, the earliest esoteric tantras, both Hindu and Buddhist, tell a quite different story before that reformation. In these, initiation was a violent affair in which the yoginis and dakinis would only offer tantric gnosis and initiations in exchange for the flesh and blood of male aspirants. The Hindu tantras frequently evoke the two alternatives faced by humans with regard to these supernatural female predators. While most were doomed to become food for the yoginis, the tantric practitioner, often called a yogi but sometimes called a vira, which means a virile hero, could instead become the darling of the yoginis. However, in some cases, one could only become the darling of the yoginis by first passing through their bellies. They had to eat you first. A description found in the Tantra Sadbhava, a circa 8th century Hindu Tantra from Kashmir, encapsulates their modus operandi when it says, a female being who, for the purpose of shape shifting, continually drinks the fluids of living beings after extracting them by witchcraft, and who, after obtaining those fluids, slaughter those victims, she shall be known as a shakini. And there's a lot to read there. I'm going to sort of read it to you while you're looking at it. A proof text for the incorporation of these shapeshifters into tantric metaphysics and doctrines of salvation is the 9th century Hindu Netra Tantra, whose 20th chapter is devoted to three types of yoga. And I'll just talk about the first here, called Supreme Yoga which is introduced in the text by a question that the goddess poses to Shiva. Shiva re is revealing this esoteric teaching to the goddess. And she asks him, how do the yoginis, the mothers, and the still mightier, mightier shakinis instantly extract the vital breaths from the body of another being? And in response, Shiva explains that by eating their bodies, the yoginis are in reality destroying the karmic impediment that differentiates mortal creatures from their divine maker, from Shiva himself. And this is why they're called yoginis. 
um, because yogini and yoga and yogi, they're all the, g- generated from a verb, yuj, which means to yoke. And it's a, it's a cognate of the English word yoke. So they are female yokers. They yoke their victims to the state of being of Shiva. By eating this sinful body, they eat away the only impediment to identity with Shiva. This is the supreme goal, goal of Hindu tantric practice, to become a second Shiva, to become identical with Shiva. And so Shiva concludes his teaching, the yoginis crunch the fetters sounds like their bones, of their victims, as a result of which the body is destroyed. But liberation realized through the destruction of the body is assuredly not killing. In fact, they're eating them, they're killing them, but they're actually doing something far better. They're giving them a transcendent state of being. Between the 7th and 10th centuries before Buddhism effectively disappeared from the Indian subcontinent, it also took a tantric turn likely drawing much of its inspiration from the esoteric Hindu tantras. As such, early Buddhist tantric references to the Dakinis, because that's what they're always called in Buddhism, are redolent of the descriptions of the Shakinis and Shabaris and Yoginis found in Hindu sources. Now, a light motif of the early Hindu tantras was the Yoginis' extraction of the essence of their victims, and the Buddhist tantras elaborated on this concept, referring to the concretion or the yellow of men found in the hearts of human males. And this is discussed in at least two important Japanese tantric commentaries dating from the 12th and 13th centuries, which speak of the Dakinese fondness for this concretion, this yellow of men. So the first of them says, the Dakinese are little demonesses belonging to the entourage of Yama, who's the god of death, both in Hindu and Buddhist tradition. They feed on the flesh of all living creatures. What they especially enjoy is the accumulation of six dewdrops found in the Cranial Sutra. We call this the yellow of men. This yellow is the soul of living creatures. It is the Dakini's favorite food. King Yama, who oversees the longevity of all beings, sends the Dakini messenger into the body of those who are about to die due to their past karma. In the course of six months, the Dakini licks men from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet And when she's done licking, she swallows their breath, sucks their blood, and takes their life. Happy end. This is a line drawing that is showing you what's in this very, what's the word, the opposite of sharp, um, blurred um, detail from a Japanese uh, womb mandala located on the southwest corner of the mandala, which is the direction of Yama, the god of death. You have these three dakinis. And you can see she's got a leg in her mouth, and that's probably another appendage. Uh, And uh, yeah, they're enjoying what they like. Um, These womb mandalas are detailed in word descriptions in a very important tantra called the Mahavairochana Sutra. And this is an image taken from the word descriptions that one finds in that text. So now I'm going to read you the second commentary. When men enter into their death throes, the Dakinis will go to them and eat their livers. By virtue of that, men will, in their death throes, be able to reach true understanding, thereby permitting them to be reborn in the pure land. Now we're in the pure land form of Buddhism. If they were not to eat their livers, those men would not be able to reach true understanding. In traditions for which gnosis, true understanding, was the supreme path to salvation, dakini or yogini inflicted death by evisceration would have been a desirable end. And in a number of tantric scriptures, a special place is given to the person who was a man for seven lives. A source of supernatural powers, the flesh, and most especially the concretion, the yellow of such a person, was highly attractive to yoginis and dakinis. This you find in both Hindu and Buddhist tantras. After being eaten, each rebirth for a series of seven brought him closer to identity with God, And with each rebirth, his flesh appeared to be charged with greater charisma, affording additional supernatural powers to any yogini or dakini who would happen to kill, eat, or even touch or talk to him. So he becomes this yogini magnet, and they keep coming for him until they've eaten him seven times. And then, presumably, he becomes a second shiva, and he doesn't have to be eaten again. 
the yoginis would enjoy him many times over, gaining or enhancing their supernatural powers in the process, while the male practitioner received tantric teachings, in return access to their tantric throng, and the pleasures offered by them as his sexual consorts. I'm going to read to you where these places are and so forth. So in the Hindu and Buddhist tantras of South and East Asia, the jackal was the mammalian body of choice for these female shapeshifters. And very often the line between jackals and these tantric goddesses was a blurry one. And sometimes the identification of the two was explicit, as in a tantra called the Kula Tridamani, where the practitioner, the, the yogi, is instructed to offer food to jackals with the words, take, O goddess, you who are in the form of a jackal, accept this offering. And a Sanskrit word for jackal reinforces this identification because when the name of the supreme Hindu tantric god Shiva is given a feminine ending, Shiva, that's what that, that macron over the A is, Shiva, it can mean Mrs. Shiva, or a female form of Shiva, but it also just means jackal. So they are embody, female embodiments of Shiva in the form of jackals. And so you start seeing them appearing in tantric contexts. As energies of Shiva, again, the nature of tantra says, that have attest, attained a state of oneness with the god, their name bespeaks both the yoginis' identity with Shiva and their wild mammalian form. They begin to appear in iconography in India in about the 8th century uh, in places such as Rajasthan. There, the, the jackal's lost his head. He's looking at you. That's his severed head, severed trunk there. There he's quite clearly represented in this. Um, these are both uh, images of Chamunda, who's also a goddess associate, terrible goddess of, of death and destruction. You can see why. Um, this is also Chamunda, but she here and this yogini here are from a yogini temple, also in Orissa, uh, the delightful little temple at Hirapur. Uh, Orissa in the extreme eastern part of the country, Rajasthan in the western part of the country. And then way up in Kathmandu, you have this painting on a temple wall that I'll come back to of a jackal with a severed hand or arm in its, in its mouth. Um, now that has two dates because the temple was first built in the 15th century, but they re repaint it every eight years. So that's a, a version from the 20th century, uh, or if not the 21st. I didn't take that picture, though. Um, and then they keep reappearing in miniature paintings, um, such as these. Uh, and there's your real jackals up there. Um, these were the jackals that were in the foreground of that first miniature painting that I showed you, the very first slide. Um, you can see, though, they're doing their thing here uh, in another cremation ground. Actually, this isn't a cremation. It is in a cremation ground, as is this, or a charnel ground, a place where the bodies are disposed of. These are quite recent. These are this being the earliest 1610, and these two are 18th, 19th century. The identification of yoginis with jackals and birds also translated into their medieval iconography, where they often appear as naked women with the heads of animals and birds. And in what appears to be a modern day survival of certain elements of this concept, a festival celebrated to this day in Kathmandu on the dark of the moon in early spring features a simulated human sacrifice to the tantric goddess Vatsala, in which a jackal god and a jackal king figure prominently. As Axel Mikhailz describes it, the night comes to a glorious end as the jackal king, the tantric priest channeling the jackal god, howls like a jackal. In the three days that follow, a series of processions and animal sacrifices take place. These, however, according to Mikhailz, mask a now lost tradition of human sacrifice to Vatsala, in which jackals played a leading role. The Nepali royal chronicles repeatedly report that Vatsala once demanded humans, and several chronicles refer to the loud cries made by the man jackal, or you could perhaps read the word as the man for the jackals. As Mikhail surmises, presumably the human sacrificial victims were given to the jackals, of which there were many in the area around this temple, as suggested by the chronicles, which relate that the jackals howled so loudly that the people became deaf. And even today, the, the site of the funeral pyre at this place is called Jambu Deepa, which literally means in this context, the light for the jackals. So the light that draws them 
so that they can eat the bhikkhu. And the legacy of these practices may be viewed to this day on the eastern wall of the temple where you see the jackal with the severed arm in its mouth. Toward the end of the first millennium BC, uh, CE, Buddhist Tantra reached the shores of Japan. I've already read you two commentaries from 12th, 13th century Japan. An island king with no native jackals, and where the tantric dakinis came to be cast as fox maidens or vixens. Here, a series of figures from an 11th century guide from the Tantric Tendai school illustrates three transformations of a demoness that the monks were empowered to exercise, exorcise, through the ritual of the six syllables. In this line drawing, the human figure is identified in the text as a demoness. The figure to her right is identified as an earth fox, while the bird to her left is not, as one would expect, identified as a raptor, but rather as a sky fox. Now, Buddhist Tantra came to Japan via China, where such an identification had already been made in the 8th century, which, in a certain source, equated Dakinis with indigenous demons of fox possession. But the Chinese Tantric text also evoked another type of fox, which they called the smelly fox, Shunhu. While this was also the Chinese translation for the Sanskrit word for owl, or a Sanskrit word for owl, which I will discuss later, uluka, word descriptions portrayed this as an airborne fox-like figure, active exclusively at night, a sort of fox vampire. And here we see the likely origin for the Japanese sky fox in the ritual of the six syllables. A few centuries later, Japanese dakini iconography would collapse these three modes of being into a single image, a weapon wielding winged tantric goddess riding a fox from 1300. Even today, there are fox temples in Japan, uh, Kitsuna. You know that, that brand uh, Kitsun that they sell stuff in Beverly Hills? It's fox. Um, in Tibet, where they don't have jackals or foxes, but they have wolves, this is Kondroit Somo, the female wolf-headed leader of the Dakinis. Um, and this kind of reverses the image from Japan in the sense that rather than being a human-headed, winged figure riding a fox, here you have a human, well, a wolf-headed human figure riding the birds that are her yoginis. Uh, and, um, you can see she's enjoying the innards of her victim. This poor guy didn't have a chance. I should stress here that these cultural categories do not necessarily correspond to biological taxonomies. And with this, I would suggest that across South Asia, Dakinis were also identified with fox bats or flying foxes. In India, fox bats are enormous mammals with wingspans up to six feet. They are noisy and filthy two common descriptors of the yoginis, which one medieval Indian work called Filthy Birds of the Night, and we just saw this word smelly fox. Perhaps that's what that's about. Now, it is the case that no identif identifiable sculpted image of a bat has ever surfaced in the South Asian iconographic record. Furthermore, one never encounters the Sanskrit word for bat in descriptions of the airborne yoginis. But it's also a fact that the Sanskrit word for bat is nearly nowhere to be found in the Sanskrit literature. Now, you do find dic dictionary words that lexicographers translate as bat, and some of them make sense. Uh, one of them is charmachataka, which means a skin sparrow. OK, that's like our little bats, right? Another is uh, ajina patra, um, hairy, skin, hairy skin wing. Yeah, OK, that sounds batty. Um, Others uh, include vatuli and valgula, which may have been terms for flying foxes or a species of night bird. Um, this is interesting because uh, this is one of the most famous images of a yogini. She's doing this because it's a secret tradition. She's saying mum's the word. Um, she, now, it's said that she's riding a bat. Well, eh, I mean, not a bat, I'm sorry, an owl. I don't know about that. It's, maybe, it's got the eyes of an owl, but maybe it's a bat. Maybe not. Anyway, if you haven't seen a fox bat, they're pretty wild and crazy, huh? Now, that's a painting from the 18th century, but there's your guy with his six-foot wingspan there. And then when they're just hanging out, or when they're on the ground, they look more like foxes, except they've got that extra stuff behind their backs. So 
shapeshifters, right? So perhaps words fail here. Imagine you're a tantric yogi on a lonely hilltop, hallucinating from sleep depression, deprivation as well perhaps as from drugs and the consumption of blood and raw flesh. It's the dark of the moon and the dead of night. Suddenly loud animal cries appear from all around, from the air above as well as the earth below. The night is teeming with screeching yoginis, night raptors, flying foxes, so many skin jackals on the hunt for prey. And again, when they're in the air, they look like birds. When they're on the ground, they look like mammals. And then you've got the human yoginis sort of in the mix there. Um, so shapeshifters, right? All three aspects maybe were present at the same time, the same place, but it was dark out and the guy was hallucinating. And, but this is what we read about in these texts. As with the case of the Chinese and Japanese jackals and foxes, biology is not culture, and blood-drinking bats and smelly foxes and owls may have been a cultural category in medieval South Asia, in the same way that they became so in the West through Bram Stoker's Dracula. The vampires do not suck human blood. They eat fruit. So do these guys. But culturally, maybe they do some other stuff. And this would appear to have been the case in the late 18th century, as the natural historian Georges Cuvier noted, Fox bats are very large bats found in India and Africa. Their ears are small. Their tongues bristle with backward curving spines. It's said that they suck the blood of sleeping men and animals without waking them. Others say they live on fruit. Well, there you go. The, which is right, A or B? Both. Now here's this word kula, which means swarm, and also means lineage or clan or family. Um, yogini temples. This is just a cluster of yoginis, a little cluster of stones in Rajasthan, but they're identified as yoginis. This is from a real yogini temple, the one at Hirapur that I showed you a uh, detail from. You can see it's a curved, it's a circular temple. It has no roof because the yoginis got to fly in and fly out. If there's a roof, they couldn't get in or out. And there's stories about people trying to put roofs on these and the yoginis blow them off until they get the, they get the message and they stop putting roofs on their temples. Um, so, these kulas are these swarms, these circular swarms, and the, another word for these circles is chakra, and actually they get internalized into these chakras at a later time. And there are many, there's a very famous image of the chakras that actually has names of yoginis next to each of the seven uh, that um, I could show you maybe. And then you've got the sort of notion of kulas as circles and swarms, so you've got this pack of jackals eating a dead body and this swarm of, are they birds or bats, flying through the air. These are kulas. And uh, with this in mind, I wish to introduce the language of the earliest inscription that names the Dakinis from India. It's a fifth century inscription from central India, uh, very close to where that temple, uh, the eighth century temple that had the jackals in it uh, is located. And in this inscription, um, the temple was um, um, offered to the noise-making Dakinis, whose clouds are made to swell by the powerful winds generated by tantric spells. And what I'm suggesting here is that while fox bats or flying foxes are taxonom taxonomically mammals, they may culturally have been clouds of filthy birds, i.e. Dakinis, that shared South Asian charnel grounds with jackals filling the night with a chorus of cries. And you do read that kind of language in the tantras, that the, when the yoginis appear, you hear the sounds of jackals and uh, kites, which is a big bird, uh, and also this kind of screeching sound, which again, is it a bayad, is it a bird? It's, in any case, that's, you hear them when the yoginis come around. The great 11th century Hindu tantric author Abhinava Gupta discusses this term kula at some length, underscoring the fact that it's applied to both humans and animals, and that it's just derived from a verbal root kul that means to condense or become solid. Dictionary definitions of the term include flock, herd, multitude of quadrupeds, birds, insects, or inanimate objects. So when yoginis and dakinis were identified as birds or animals, they were the scavengers and predators that haunted battlefields and charnel grounds, packs of jackals and vultures and kites that converged en masse to cover a body alive or dead with their bodies until they reduced it to a bare skeleton with their beaks, talons, teeth, and claws. Or they were birds whose infestations of a region could pick it clean, plagues of parrots with which the yoginis were also identified are attested in a number of Indic chronicles. 
Alternatively, they were insects who did the same, swarms of locusts capable of destroying harvests, forests, and pasturage in a matter of days or hours. Or insect larvae, maggots, that could do the same to a rotting cadaver. Um, yeah, this, is, this is a quote from a 12th century work. This is an illustration from a 19th century um, illuminated manuscript. Um, Subhuti's nocturnal vision is of a form of Shiva named Virabhadra, um, and he is associated with demons and, and dakinis and yoginis. And so you see him surrounded by these somewhat troublesome beings. This is apparently a river of blood. And uh, some of these figures are holding appendages in their hands. Looks like she's nibbling on something. And then I don't quite know what these are. You know, birds with stuff in their mouths, too. If these are sprites of some sort, but it, this is sort of this, this demonological pandemonium, this swarms of whatever. The yoginis and dakinis of the tantric kulas were teeming creatures that swarmed, reducing to naught whatever lay in their passage. And it may be that the clouds of fox bats, screeching nocturnal human-sized winged mammals, bore an elective affinity with these shape-changing females. Here I'm going to circle back for a moment to my earlier comparativist arguments concerning the identity of these female were creatures in ancient Europe, because similar issues surround the Roman strigae. And here we're going to step away for a moment from Dakinis and Yoginis and strigae who devour their victims to something else. While the primary meaning of strix in Greek and striga in Latin is a kind of owl regarded as a bird of ill omen, sometimes a vampire or evil spirit, its description in various sources appeared to conform to that of a bat. Pliny the Elder appeared to be of this opinion when he wrote in 77 CE the following. Among flying species, only the bat has milk. As I think the story about strigae, that they drop milk from their teats into the mouths of babies, is a fabrication. It is an acknowledged fact that even in olden days, the screech owl was one of the creatures under a curse, but what particular bird is meant, I believe, to be uncertain. The curse to which Pliny refers likely concerns Polyphonte, a woman who, according to a circa 4th century BCE Greek myth, was transformed into a strix that cries by night, without food or drink, with head below and tips of feet above, a harbinger of war and civil strife to men. In his analysis of this myth, Samuel Oliphant has argued that the strigae were not birds, but rather bats. And this he does on the basis of ancient accounts of its nocturnal habits, its identification as a harbinger of evil, its sharp stridulous scream, its loathing of food during hibernation, and the fact that it hangs upside down when at rest, head above, head below, feet above. His interpretation is strengthened by a reference attributed to Titinius, who was another of Pliny's sources, to a black strix that attacks boys, offering its foul-smelling breasts to their evil, eager lips for suck. Together with Plautus's Pseudolus, which I cited at the beginning of my lecture, this is the earliest Latin reference to the strix. The same applies to Ovid's tale of the death of Proca, related earlier, wherein the description of the strigae conforms to the appearance and behavior of bats. These include their voraciousness, their comparison to the harpies, their great heads, their beady eyes, their gray color, their hooked claws, their nocturnal flight, and their strident cry. Now, coeval with and virtually identical to these Greek and Roman accounts of the strigae are descriptions found in a number of early Indian demonological sources of a group of female Caesars, Rahanis, who were the forerunners in the Ayurvedic tradition of the Dakinis and the Yoginis. These creatures were enshrined in the Ayurvedic science of pediatrics, which maintained that certain childhood diseases were caused by the empoisoned milk of the female Caesars, that is, of demonesses that killed infants by suckling them with their poisoned breasts. This was precisely the modus operandi of a demoness named Putana, whose name means stinky, who, according to the circa 3rd century Harivamsha, flew through the night in the form of a bird of evil omen to the village of the infant god Krishna. So that's what you see here. There she morphed into a woman, a beautiful woman, to offer her poison breast to the divine child, but because he was a god, he sucked the life out of her instead of being poisoned by her breast. And then when she's dead, she returns to her actual demonic-looking 
aspect, which is she's quite horrible to look at. So returning once more to the tantric tradition of supreme yoga, and I'm nearly at the end of my talk. It must be noted that offering one's body up to be eaten by packs or swarms of predatory females is a most unusual path to salvation. Would you agree with me on that? Among all the possible ways to just transcend the human condition and realize union or identity with God, this surely ranks among the strangest. Did the Hindus and Buddhists, tantric yogis, really invent this soteriological system out of whole cloth, or did they take their inspiration from some earlier or perhaps foreign tradition? I raise the question because in India, the compilers and custodians of the sacred scriptures were nearly always Brahmins. They were the only people who could write in Sanskrit, for one thing. And they were very conservative in their respect for scriptural precedent. They didn't usually invent myths so much as readapt them. Like the Supreme Court, we hope, with its practice of judicial review, the priestly compilers and commentators were keen to justify the new in terms of the old, to cloak modern innovation in the garb of ancient tradition. So was there a precedent for this tantric practice and its soteriological rationale? The classical Sanskrit term for hyena is tarakshu. However, as Stephanie Jameson has shown on the basis of a curious Vedic myth dating from no later than 1000 BC, an earlier term for these creatures may have been shala vrikka, literally house wolf. But more properly speaking, shala vrikki, uh, female house wolf, since the term only appears in its feminine form in Vedic mythology. Now recall here that the most common Sanskrit term for jackal is Shiva, also a word with a feminine ending. Uh, and what was it then about jackals and hyenas that made them culturally fem feminine creatures? In South Asian traditions, jackals like hyenas are said to be possessed of the power of speech. They laugh, they howl, they talk. And one finds references throughout the world to hyenas whose moans draw unsuspecting victims into their lairs in order to eat them. But the perceived femininity of hyenas goes beyond their power of seductive, deceptive speech. So for example, the Rig Veda states that there are no friendships with women, they have the hearts of hyenas. But biology may actually play a role here. Because as Jameson notes, in hyena societies, it is the females that dominate, with dens being inhabited by the alpha female and her cubs, and older males generally shut out to fend for themselves in the wild. Furthermore, among spotted hyenas, the females are larger than males. And getting back to that image I showed you early on, their clitoris looks exactly like a penis, in addition to which the female has a sham scrotum that looks very masculine indeed. This is not from Stephanie Jameson, an endologist, but from a biologist. Male or female, they are formidable predators. They have massive heads and jaws. Uh, and those of the spotted hyena are the most powerful of any mammal on the planet. They can crush the biggest bones of their prey to extract the marrow. So in that Vedic myth, analyzed by Jameson, Indra, the champion of the Vedic gods, himself takes the form of a female hyena, a shalavriki, to, feel her, to feed her male cubs. What Indra, as female hyena, feeds her cubs is of signal interest. She feeds them yatis. Who were the yatis? Before the term yogi entered into the Sanskrit lexicon, the itinerant male ascetics of ancient Indian India were often called yatis, a word that means wanderers. As such, this Vedic tradition of yatis and hyenas may have been the scriptural precedent for supreme yoga, the tantric yogi's self-sacrifice to these shape-changing and gender-bending dakinis and yoginis. So getting back to what we started with, there really is eye contact in the original uh, that pretty much goes like this. So you, you've got three players here, the tantric goddess in her jackal form and the tantric yogi uh, who's been transformed into a second Shiva. And we know that because he's got that halo with the crescent moon in it, which means he is Shiva. He's only got two arms though, so we know he's a, he's a human, but he's a human who's become transformed as Shiva. By the way, that little plume of fire, that's He's speaking a mantra. That's an indication that he's, he's using a, a formula to, in some way, influence the goddess. But uh, perhaps she's already been influenced because she may be sitting on him uh, seven times over. Uh, she's enjoyed him seven times. And so this is how one becomes, uh, transcends the human condition in a tantric context by being food 
for the yoganis. Now, is this any way to transcend the human condition? It's certainly food for thought. <laughs> That's the end of my talk. <laughs> I'm going to yield the floor. Do you need this? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Well, that was uh, a rather fascinating lecture, uh, to say the least. Um, you know, thinking in terms of what my remarks will be, they'll be more uh, sort of a bit of psychological reflection. I'll do the kind of classical Jungian thing to reflect a bit on this. But there's a lot to um, to take away from this. I mean, I just so fascinated with the idea of the fear of the feminine and the, the, the night and the unconscious in, in that sense. And here, what struck me um, as compared to what I know about the Western, especially the Christian traditions about witches, um, was that they very rarely have any kind of redemptive qualities at all. And really fascinating to um, this whole idea of uh, being eaten as a form of transformation. Um, I think that's something that I can't think of a parallel very close in the West. I mean, there's Medea who, you know, chops up her father-in-law and uh, supposedly is going to reconstruct him, or Isis and putting Osiris back together, but not quite this kind of metabolism. So, <laughs> yeah. as an analyst, I was thinking about this, you know, wh what are we, um, potentially talking about if we were to say, well, you know, these are the creatures of nightmares, you know, certainly vampires and werewolves and and these kind of uh, witch-like creatures are the things that haunt dreams. Uh, and if they suck out the life and the blood and and so forth, and we're obviously going to be looking at things like libido and psychic energy and the way that gets depleted. and transformations that happen with that. For me, you can think about this in your own experience. Uh, has anyone ever chewed your head off? <laughs> you know, I mean, there are just psychologically what it's like, or just sort of ripped you to shreds. Uh, you know, these are fantasies about that. But here it extends in, an, in another dimension. And I'm brought back to the ideas of the uh, psychoanalyst uh, D.W. Winnicott, who talked about being able to survive kind of massive attacks from clients, you know, when they got really rageful and angry, which, think about the hyena image here, it, it has some of that quality to it. That the ability to listen and remain within an analytically reflective space as you're being um, sort of excoriated is part of the transformational process to be able to survive with your, with your um, psyche and with your mind. Um, and the thing I like about the the Eastern transformation as you go along the Silk Road further is that uh, there's a deep pathologizing. What what in you know the DSM we might think about borderline personality disorder and rage and the kind of uh, the wish to eviscerate. Um, here it has a it has a transformative. Uh, dimension and quite frankly, as an analyst, uh, working with trauma victims who are often very enraged about their experiences below the surface, that that kind of level of anger and aggression often does come out as a part of the process. But if you begin to see it as something that both people need to go through as a part of the transformative experience between them, then it's a very different story that actually the analyst through the counter-transference is undergoing something that's uh, a bit more like a partnership here. This is in the alchemical literature in the West that would have been the Sor Mystica together with the alchemist who would have begun to create this, this new gold. Um, and all of the possibilities that were there. So, is it, is this a kind of uh, an imagining of uh, our relationship to our animal instincts um, that we uh, become able to honor them in a new way, and and our relationship to death? I think that's also an extremely important component in this the fear of death, the uh, the kind of mythologies we have, um, 
that have lost the cycles of nature. There are an awful lot of cyclical material in this, and I thought that was extremely important, the, the kinds of ways in which things move uh, in and through in a kind of um, reflective and reflexive process that um, we often, in our culture, move in too linear a fashion, which tends to push us, perhaps, in that uh, kind of hyper masculine kind of thought process that that can stir this kind of uh, reaction. So I was also thinking about, when I went through this, uh, a, a couple of clinical examples uh, from my own practice. I, I remember someone um, some years ago who uh, had a, a, what would be diagnosed as a manic depressive condition. and. When the mania would become particularly intense, um, it linked into trauma history, and the vision was that uh, she would eat demons, and she would eat demons off of pe uh, the weak portions of people. So, for example, if you were wearing glasses, it indicated, it gave the image to her that there were demons there attacking your eyes and that it, it was her job in this kind of redemptive fashion to consume these kinds of creatures, the daimons. And then uh, on, at that point, it became unbearable for her because she would fill with these and then they would sort of explode out of her. She wasn't able to metabolize and digest them. And that was part of the process that we worked on containing uh, over the course of time. And in fact, um, what happened over the course of about two years of uh, analytic work, there was a figure of a, of a, a black volcanic woman um, came up out of the earth, fiery, who at first was a figure of terror and over a couple of years became um, a kind of internal teacher. And the with the advent of that process, uh, the demonic, the need to consume the demonic was uh, subsided. Uh, so you can see that these things live in the imaginations of contemporary Americans. I mean, we just are not so attuned to all of them. And what a gift it is to have a kind of an articulated history that takes us uh, in this movement uh, around the world, the way these things were carried. I mean, I'm particularly interested in the Silk Road. I've seen the other, the, the positive side of this in, from the Tang Dynasty, the Apsura, uh, you know, these sort of the heavenly uh, female deities. And they're, 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 they're the other side of this, but they have dark dimensions to them as well. So I think it's really important that we, um, we look at our own tendency to, to split these things and bring them back into some kind of synthetic harmony. I think that's, the, the gift of a talk like this evening. So there are a lot of other things I could talk about, but I think I want to give you a chance to engage. So just that was to stimulate a little more thinking on your part. Thanks.